Hi, my name is Orjo Shan. I'm an undergraduate student at the University of Florida. Today we have with us Dr. Tanner, who is a distinguished professor in the Department of Physics at the University of Florida. Dr. Tanner is involved with the ADMX research, the condensed matter experiment, as well as the LIGO experiment. Since our topic of discussion today is LIGO, I would like to firstly ask you, what is your research group's role in LIGO and advanced LIGO? Oh, thank you. I'm very nice to be here. Uh, the uh, University of Florida has been involved with LIGO since 1995 or 1996 and has a number of projects. Uh, well, the one I've worked on are uh, what we call instrument science for mm -hmm. LIGO. And we were lucky enough at the very beginning to be able to build uh, a subsystem, some optical equipment and parts that was called the input optics. And so Florida built the input optics for initial LIGO and then uh, when the time came to upgrade to advanced LIGO, we built new input optics uh, for advanced LIGO. And in this, of course, there were graduate students, postdocs, and at least two other faculty, David Reitze, who's now LIGO lab director, and uh, uh, Guido Mueller, who is a faculty member here. Uh, both of them worked on both times the input optics. Mm -hmm. So when was LIGO first conceived? It was conceived in the 80s. Um, the idea of using a laser interferometer to detect gravitational waves uh, was uh, developed by a number of people at the same time in the 80s, including people like Ray Weiss at MIT and Ron Drever then in Glasgow. Uh, and as a project itself, it was proposed to the NSF in the late 1980s. Mm -hmm. So it's a lo very long running project. Could you explain a little bit more about the laser interferometer? Okay, certainly. It's, a, um, it's basically a laser rangefinder, mm -hmm. and the idea is to measure the distance to two mirrors, each of which is from where the laser sits, uh, four kilometers away, 2.8 miles away. And if a gravitational wave comes by, those mirrors are moved by a tiny, tiny amount, ten to the minus 20 meters or so. But the uh, interferometer is sensitive enough to detect that motion in a systematic way and, and uh, to then discover, as they did a few years ago, uh, gravitational waves. And when was the original anticipated timeline in terms of detecting gravitational waves? Well, it was optimistic, of course. Uh, the instrument uh, really started being built in the mid-90s by preparing the sites. It was important to have two sites. One is in uh, Washington State on the Hanford Reservation in eastern Washington State, and the other is near Baton Rouge in Louisiana. And you wanted two uh, well-separated sites so that both would see the same signal and you would know it's not some environmental disturbance or interference. Uh, and they finished uh, civil construction around 2000. And then the optical parts, including the input optics and the core optics, which really are the mirrors that do the detection, were installed. And it took four or five years until roughly around 2007, uh, they, the, the instrument was as sensitive as it was designed to be, from which, after which it ran for a number of years as this initial LIGO without ever detecting anything. <laughs> and what was the most difficult challenge that was on the horizon at that moment? Well, um, there were lots uh, because this was a completely new instrument. The prototypes were much smaller, easier to build and less, uh, less uh, um, aggressive or, or less technically challenging. And um, so the original, um, originally they were much noisier than, uh, than was expected. So there's always a background to any science experiment. And the background was rather high because of vibrations and various issues with uh, alignment and so forth. And so it was basically a very methodical um, uh, approach taken by the LIGO team, not so much the University of Florida, uh, to find the sources of noise and figure ways to make them less intrusive and work on them and so forth. How long did it take to overcome this challenge and what allowed for this breakthrough? It was about four or five years, and it was just hard work by a few people. I can point to Rana Adkahari, who was an undergraduate at the University of Florida and worked in the LIGO lab before he went to graduate school at MIT. He and some other quite young scientists just spent every minute of working, waking minute of their lives 
working on this for a number of years, and the result was, uh, as I said, it reached its design sensitivity, which is about as good as you can do after this work is accomplished. Mm -hmm. And talking about the details of gravitational waves themselves, mm -hmm. how small are these oscillations? Oh, the oscillations are quite small. The scale is uh, much smaller than the diameter of a proton, which is the smallest elementary particle we see uh, regularly. Um, uh, so the scale is 10 to the minus 20, say, uh, uh, meters. Oh, wow. So, much, so you sort of start with the mirrors being four kilometers apart, and they move apart in 10 to the 23rd of their separation. Mm -hmm. So it's a teeny motion. But the laser design of the laser system, the optical system, uh, magnifies this. And in the end, one gets a detectable signal. Mm -hmm. And what is the basic principle of the detector that allows us to detect these small oscillations? Well, it uses a very precise laser. Uh, the laser wavelength is about one micrometer, but it's controlled to a very high precision, so it doesn't change over time. And so uh, there are two mirrors that are separated by uh, uh, from the beam splitter by four kilometers and they are operated at right angles and the light goes out and back in these two directions and interferes. It's the way waves at the beach, uh, often reflected waves will interfere with incoming waves and you see waves growing or shrinking in, in uh, amplitude. And so we detect this interference as a change of the distance to the two mirrors and uh, uh, that gives us the signal that we're seeking. Okay. And what were some of these challenges involved in de detecting these oscillations? And can you describe how they were tackled? Well, um, each in any measurement, there is always background noise. So, for example, uh, the sensitivity of a detector might be limited by how many photons the light is, from the laser is made up of individual photons, mm -hmm. and those photons uh, have to be counted and some way or another. And if you count a bunch of them, you always miss one or two. And so the variation that you get when you count the photons is called shot noise. Mm -hmm. And that's an, a background that has to be overcome. And the way you overcome it is by making the laser more powerful. So in several of the upgrades that have taken place, the laser power has changed from a few watts to a few hundred watts. And that gives an increase in the sensitivity. Okay. Uh, and did seismic activity and Brownian motion in any way contribute yeah, to that this? That contributes to the background as well. So uh, the Earth's surface seems rock solid when you're standing on it, but it's actually moving up and down and left and right uh, uh, significant distances during the, uh, the measurement times. And one, if the mirrors were resting on the Earth, they would be hopelessly noisy. Mm -hmm. So the mirrors are uh, uh, set up with vibration isolation systems on the tables that, that support the mirrors, and then they're pendula, so they're, the mass of the mirror is strung, held from a, 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 a suspension point above by a wire, or glass fiber, mm -hmm. and so it can swing back and forth, because in order to respond to the gravitational wave, it has to be free to move, because the gravitational wave, by Newton's law of gravitation, exerts a force, mm -hmm. or by Einstein's arguments about curved space and time, uh, the mirror is, has to move, and so it's free to move in the horizontal plane. But that also isolates it from the vibrations, because if you shake the top of the suspension, the bottom of the mirror just remains fixed, because it all, can only swing at its natural frequency and vibrations at higher frequencies, which is the frequency band for which LIGO is sensitive, are filtered out tremendously. And there are several stages of seismic isolation in that respect. You also asked about Brownian motion. The surfaces of the mirrors are at finite temperatures, and so they undergo Brownian motion. Solid state physicists would say that they have uh, vibrational modes in them. Uh, maybe phonons would be one way to say that. And um, uh, the Brownian motion interferes with the laser interference. So scientists, including a number here at Florida, are looking for better materials that would have less Brownian motion or more constrained Brownian motion to reduce the contribution of the mirror coatings to the background noise. 
Okay, and talking about the computational aspects of LIGO, mm -hmm. did we have the computing power necessary to detect the um, gravitational waves when LIGO first collected it? Well, LIGO built up over its first years uh, considerable computing resources. And they were brought in by the lab itself and by a number of universities that joined as participants in the LIGO scientific collaboration. So it's always had enough computing power to analyze the data. It takes quite a bit. Uh, it's uh, on the scale of a large-scale computing facility. Um, it has never had excess, but it's always had enough. Can you talk more about this computing software that LIGO uses? Well, uh, one of the more, more interesting ones uh, was written here at the University of Florida. It's called the Coherent Wave Burst. And it was developed by Professor Sergei Kromenko uh, when he was a scientist with the, La with the LIGO group and Professor Mitzelmacher was uh, the principal investigator and, and one of the leaders of this project. And coherent wave burst looks for, uh, as its name suggests, bursty type signals. Mm -hmm. So if, when two black holes, we see two black holes in this picture behind, miss, behind us uh, uh, orbit each other and then collide, they produce a burst of gravitational radiation that lasts perhaps a second or so, maybe much less than a second. And coherent wave burst looks at the two interferometers output in a coherent way, that's what the name coherent does, to detect whether they both saw something that was similar in the, between the two interferometers. And Sergey's program was the one that detected the first observation of gravitational waves back in September of 2015. Uh, it was the only online program that detected this very important event because it was the initial observation. And so it, it requires to look a uh, very rapid rate at the output of the interferometer, uh, re receive that data, filter it in various ways, and then combine it with the output of the other interferometer, allowing for the light travel time or the gravitational wave travel time between the two sites because they are separated and it takes time for a signal to propagate mm -hmm. from one to the other. Um, what percent of the collaboration is devoted to tackling these computing issues? That's a good question. Um, maybe 60 or 70 percent of the uh, collaboration, known as the LIGO scientific collaboration, has about 1,200 people in it, um, is on the data analysis side. So they're devoted to uh, analyzing the data in various ways, and there are a number of so-called pipelines that take the interference from the uh, interferometers and search them for gravitational waves of various types. So 70%, six or seven, 800 people, and then the remaining people are considered instrument scientists who work on the, the instrument side, improving it or understanding what its properties are, mm -hmm. characterizing the performance and so forth. Now talking about the next step in LIGO, could you describe more about advanced LIGO? Okay, good. Yeah, Advanced LIGO was uh, conceived as a natural upgrade to the initial LIGO. So in some ways, initial LIGO was built as simply as possible to do the job mm -hmm. of uh, putting these two four-kilometer instruments together and getting light from the laser to the image detector. And Advanced LIGO, a number of improvements were made. As I already said, the laser became more powerful. That for the input optics meant we had to be able to uh, do our job with much more powerful beams and we had to develop new materials for uh, modulators and for isolators and parts of the subsystem we built. In addition, the, um, um, the uh, uh, vibration isolation, this pendulum uh, suspension system was, moved, was changed from just one single pendulum from a frame to triple and quadruple pendula so that there's a, a string that comes down or a wire, then there's a mass that can swing, but from that mass comes another wire to a lower mass which can swing, but it's filtered by the motion of the uh, upper one. And then there's four, in, four of them in a row. And this made a huge improvement, especially at lower frequencies where the ground vibration is the most intrusive. Okay. Um, Seismic platforms were improved, detectors were improved. So the whole system, the whole optical system was rebuilt mm -hmm. in a much more elaborate, difficult to make. And, but in the end, the, uh, once Advanced LIGO was built and installed, the commissioning 
went much faster than initial LIGO, largely based on the experience that the whole collaboration had with operating one of these interferometers. Okay. And what are the known technical difficulties in bringing advanced LIGO online? Well, there was uh, the, the, uh, um, the seismic isolation was a technical difficulty. Handling high laser powers, we have 100 watts of power in a little beam that's maybe a, a millimeter or two in diameter. And the materials were mirrors, the uh, uh, transmissive optics like lenses and uh, crystals that are used in, in making the electro-optic modulators or the parallel oscillator had to be able to transmit that power not only without damage, but without distorting the beam. Mm -hmm. And so we explored a variety of materials that could be used uh, at these higher powers, we developed ways of compensating for the thermal effects. Uh, it said the people who made the mirror coatings had to develop higher quality coatings that would be less likely to damage, so forth and so on. Okay, and um, LIGO is not the only gravitational wave detector, although it was the first online. Right. Um, what sort of technical difficulties are being tackled as new detectors are becoming online? The, uh, the third detector to come up is called Virgo. It's a three kilometer instrument, two arms like LIGO, uh, in uh, Cascina near Pisa in Italy. So it's kind of fitting that a gravitational wave detector is near the leaning tower of Pisa. And um, it has been operating in coincidence with LIGO for about two years now, including in the current ongoing, just begun, mm -hmm. uh, third observational run. It's a slightly less sensitive right now, but they're making great progress on it. Uh, a fourth detector is called Kagra. It's in Japan in an underground mine in Kamioka. And uh, Kagra is three kilometers also, but they had to dig a tunnel to make it underground. And uh, they are making progress in getting Kagra. Kagra is actually more or less finished and in the commissioning phase. And they, by being underground, they hope to avoid some of the seismic, uh, and it seems like by the tests that they've done that they will avoid some of the seismic uh, interferences that the surface detectors face, mm -hmm. what they have to face being in the tunnel underground. Uh, and it's uh, a fifth detector is likely to be built in India. It's been approved by the Indian government, and it is in the process right now of making the the, getting the site prepared, making the concrete uh, uh, strips that they, the beam tubes go on, making the vacuum system, mm -hmm. making the buildings, that sort of thing, that one might call civil construction. Okay. And to conclude today's talk, could you please summarize the technical difficulties and challenges faced by LIGO? Well, LIGO will continue to uh, be in the noise hunting game. So one can predict the... Uh, uh, effect of the, say the coating thermal noise through the Brownian motion or the vibrations that are brought up through the seismic isolations of the mirror. And then one tries to see whether making some changes, which could include changes to the electronic to control the position of the mirrors or changes to various damping or uh, springs and so forth in the vibration isolation system, if you would change the springs on your racing car. Um, um, and then see whether those changes make an improvement in the, in the actual performance. And it's, Advanced LIGO is close to its design sensitivity, but it still has a little ways to go. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much for being with us here today and talking to us about LIGO and its technical difficulties. Mm -hmm. Lastly, where can our viewers find your personal information or your website to find more about the work you do. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. It's been, been fun. Uh, I'm on the physics department website, so you go to physics, and then you go to faculty, and you find uh, Tanner, and then you click on that, and you find the department's version of my website. But there's a link somewhere there that says personal site. There's also a uh, cos uh, dark cosmos website uh, hosted at the university, at the physics department, which has more information about the LIGO group and other groups looking for gravitational waves and dark matter. Um, we will be sure to include all the links in our description box below. Thank you so much for watching this video with us today. Thank you.